Well, I'm heading out for a run this morning. Let's go. Looks like we got a nice sunny day. Uh, I gotta take the subway to my location first, so we're gonna go get the train before I do my run. Well, let's wait for this train. Made it to the Coney Island boardwalk. I mean, a lot has changed here over the years, and I picked the boardwalk uh, to start today's lecture because about a hundred years ago, this boardwalk was home to many attractions and it drew many visitors, including eugenics researchers from America's uh, Central Eugenic Record Office, which is in uh, Long Island. So in today's lecture, I'm gonna discuss the eugenics movement and some of its connections to psychological research. This movement was very widespread, and I could have picked uh, several locations, like a school or a hospital or something to do with the military or many other places, or even playgrounds, to illustrate the many ways that uh, eugenics permeated society and influenced its institutions. So I'll talk about why I'm here at Coney Island and the connection to eugenics later in the, in the lecture. So stay tuned, and first I need to finish my run, so I've got to get going. Hey everyone, well I made it back from my run and let's get going with this mini lecture. So this is for the learning module on eugenics, psychology, and intelligence testing. This is the first mini lecture. We're going to go into a bit of the history of the eugenics movement and begin connecting it to some issues in psychology. It'll be mostly about eugenics this one and we'll start establishing those connections to psychology a little bit at the end here and more in the next mini lecture. All right, before we get started, I just want to say that the topic of eugenics is a very big topic and I'm not a historian and I'm going to do my best to kind of put it all into a nutshell for you, which is basically impossible. So I'm going to use that museum metaphor. We're basically going to look at different artifacts and um, highlights of the movement so that we can get an appreciation for it. And once we have accomplished that, hopefully uh, to some degree of clarity, um, we will then head into some connections to psychology and cognitive psychology. So let's get started. Uh, what do we got to do? Yep. Boom. All right. If you haven't done so already, read chapter three from the textbook. This lecture will cover some highlights from that chapter. Here's what we're going to do as a roadmap. I'm going to give you a brief overview. We'll talk about Galton's eugenics. And um, for parts three and four, the big ideas here are one, the movement itself, try to get a sense of its uh, size and scope and how uh, much of a worldwide impact it had. And four, give a little list of some of the negative consequences it had for, uh, for society. And then we'll transition into connections to psychology. So let's start off with this idea of improving society. Now, eugenics was in many ways a progressive movement that was motivated to improve society. And history is full of problematic efforts to improve society, eugenics being one of them. Some of the problems include inequality and injustices. So for example, not all groups will benefit equally from the improvements that one group wants to make. And this can lead to actually oppression where oppressed groups become targets and uh, receive human rights violations in the name of improvement set out by another group. And these things happened under the name of eugenics. Psychology as a discipline also sometimes considers itself somewhat of a progressive science in that it has an aim of improving things. It also has a long and problematic history of promoting ways to improve society that are uh, not equal. Throughout this lecture, I'll be pointing to a few other resources you can read for more information. This is one of them. It's a book called Scientific Pollyannaism. It's by Oksana Yakushko. I found it highly interesting. If you're a Brooklyn College student, you can go and click this link. You can download a digital copy. 
She goes all the way from the Inquisition to positive psychology in the 1990s and so forth. And in between, there's a really fantastic chapter on the eugenic movement and its connections to psychology. So that one's chapter four, Eugenic Scientific Utopias Filled with Socially Engineered Happy Productive People. That chapter does a much better job of what I'm going to try to accomplish in, the, in this lecture. So if you've got time, go check that out. So what is or was eugenics? First of all, it began as an idea to improve society over generational time by breeding humans like other animals. So just like people, for example, breed dogs, and we have lots of different kinds of dogs of different shapes and sizes and, behave and behavior patterns, the idea was to let's just do that to people so that we can make people more like we want them to be, quote. It also developed into an ideology of socio-cultural purity or supremacy and embraced scientific racism. Another feature was that eugenics was a highly organized, widespread, and well-accepted worldwide movement. And in many ways was and is a institutionalized system of oppression that led to many human rights violations and atrocities. So why are we talking about eugenics? The methods, research questions, and motivations of many early psychologists, including those interested in cognitive abilities, were tied up in the eugenics movement. And so the socio-historical context of eugenics provides an example of how cognitive and psychological research in general can have long-term negative implications for society. So this is a lesson for us as we move forward in the course to consider ways to grapple with this history, to make different decisions in our new cognitive research, and to consider ways to make repairs for previous injustices. All right, in this section, we're going to go to the very beginning and look at Sir Francis Galton's um, description of eugenics. So he's the person who founded the idea. We've already talked about Francis Galton. He was the psychologist interested in mental imagery. He had people do the breakfast table task and imagine their breakfast table to figure out how vivid their mental imagery for the breakfast table was. But why was he interested in mental imagery? In 1880, here's a quote from his paper. He says, the larger object of my inquiry is to elicit facts that shall define the natural varieties of mental disposition in the two sexes and in different races and afford trustworthy data as to the relative frequency with which different faculties are inherited in different degrees. So he was interested in measuring people for their different aptitudes and then, well, he wanted to breed different people together so that the children would inherit the features and aptitudes that he thought were desirable. Here is Sir Francis Galton in uh, 1893. He's 71 years old, and he's being photographed as a criminal. I took uh, this picture, put it here, because it gives an example of the concept of uh, a form used to measure different uh, features of a person. So this form could be used to fill out the weight and height and hair color and all these different aspects of Francis Galton. We've got a kind of a baseball card of all of his properties. This is a theme that we will see in eugenics research throughout. They were very interested in cataloging features of people. This was part of a enterprise called anthropometry, the me measurement of people. So this was an important uh, tool that eugenicists used. They needed to measure people to figure out which ones they thought were good, which ones they thought were bad, and they needed that information before they could uh, do things they wanted to do with the eugenics movement. 
So let's take a bit of a closer look at Francis Galton. He was an interesting character. He was an English Victorian, and this is from Wikipedia. He was a statistician, polymath, sociologist, psychologist, anthropologist, eugenicist, tro tropical explorer, and so on. He was knighted in 1909. His cousin was Charles Darwin, and he proposes eugenics in 1865 in a little article. It's not very long. You can go find it on the internet and read it. It's called Hereditary Talent and Character, and he expands on these ideas in 1869 in a larger book, and then he writes about this stuff for many more years until he dies in the early 1900s. Here's a little quip from the original article, and this is where Galton suggests that people could be selectively bred to improve the stock of the human race. He focuses on the, what he calls the highest noble traits of civilized mankind, such as intellect and general intelligence. And so a general issue, if, you're, if you were trying to figure out ways to improve people in a particular direction, you have to choose the features of people you want to improve. And Galton chose things like civilized people and general intelligence, whatever those things mean, and really what they meant to him. Here's a quote from the paper. He concludes that the improvement of the breed of mankind is no great difficulty. If everybody were to agree that improving the race of man would be a very important thing to do, and if the theory of the hereditary transmission of qualities in men was as thoroughly understood as it was for domestic animals, he sees no absurdity in proposing that in some way or another the improvement would be carried into effect. Sort of a science fiction idea in 1865. We already know we can change what dogs look like by breeding them. Why can't we do it for people? He's like, why not? Why, why not? Let's try it. Seems like something that would just fall away and, you know, it wouldn't really turn into a massive worldwide movement to try to actually do these things. But um, unfortunately, this basic idea really took off. And part of the purpose of this lecture is to give you some sense of how the idea expanded. There was some scientific uh, questions that helped animate the spread of eugenics. Galton wanted to present evidence that uh, parents could pass particular traits on to their children. He needed to prove that the things he wanted to breed over time could actually be inherited, because if they weren't inherited, then there, it wouldn't work, the breeding program. So one of his missions was to create evidence to prove the inheritance idea, that all of the things like general intelligence or being civilized um, were aptitudes that could be inherited from your parents and passed on to your children. One of the ways he did that was study genealogies, and here's an example of him doing that. He's got a list of uh, fine people that he considers to be English men of distinction. And he looks at those people and tries to figure out how many of them had distinguished children or had a distinguished brother. And he does, he counts these things up and uh, tries to estimate whether uh, being somebody who has uh, superior traits like a, a musician or a painter or a notable living person, or someone who has an original mind, uh, if those people are passing on their abilities to their children through genetics or something like that, uh, you should be able to count how often that happens. So this is one of the ways that Galton tried to create evidence that these aptitudes were inherited. Galton and the eugenics movement in general made a distinction between uh, their group, 
which they refer to themselves as being civilized, and other people, which they called barbarians. So Galton contrasts the great men of civilized countries with the barbarians and savages of uncivilized countries. And there's a lots of scientific racism going on throughout his writing and the writing of many eugenicists. Here's an example from Galton where he's describing the traits and characteristics of different races, of different people of different cultural backgrounds. And he describes the American Indians as an example as naturally cold, melancholic, patient, and taciturn, containing the minimum number of affectionate and social qualities compatible with the continuance of their race. Another aspect of Galton's original ideas, or oh, sorry, Sorry, let me back up and, and say, this is an example of uh, Galton framing the eugenics movement in terms of like a cultural superiority where civilized uh, British people are more civilized and better than other people from other places who aren't civilized. Another aspect of Galton's eugenics was that he invoked fear about the extent to which moral monstrosities can be bred. So, you know, if, if, if we're looking at uh, two civilized people having children, that's one thing because they'll have a wonderful kid, according to him. But what about undesirable people? And Galton could list all sorts of people he didn't like, and he was worried that they would have children and society would collapse because all of the unwanted, undesirable people would uh, spread throughout the generations. So he wrote a lot about this kind of fear. He also advocated that eugenics become accepted as a modern worldwide religion so that a holy war could be declared against unfit people. So that's a brief description of Galton's eugenics. The next section here I have the eugenics movement in general. When I was talking about Galton's eugenics, you know, I'm mainly talking about some, I'm trying to summarize some of the things he wrote down in some of his manuscripts. The ideas in these pages, they became uh, very well accepted by many different people. They became, uh, there, there became eugenics societies in many countries, eugenics conferences, and basically national and international movements to try to do eugenics on society for at least 50 years. So the point of this third section is to give you a sense of that scope and scale of the movement. Here's a brief timeline. So in 1883, Galton coins the words eugenics throughout the 1900s. Lots of organizations emerge and spread across the world. So these are formal eugenic societies. And I'm going to say between the 1900s and the 1950s, various eugenics campaigns are waged on society. We'll talk about some of those individual influences later on. Um, World War II, we have uh, the Nazi eugenics atrocities where there was a genocide and the, the Holocaust. And this often is a turning point in describing the history of eugenics, where the, the term becomes unpopular, societies disband and rename themselves and so on. This little timeline here doesn't really do any of this justice. If you're interested in exploring the timeline a bit more closely, I recommend this link. It's a wonderful uh, website called it's eugenicsarchive.ca. There's a whole bunch of information here and they have put together a really interesting timeline that you can scroll through. So for example, you could go click on Galton's Hereditary Genius and read some information about that book. You can scroll down and get a sense of a whole bunch of different things that are happening uh, across time related to eugenics and its influences on society.
So I will say go check that out for a to fill in the gaps. Okay, so one of the points I want to emphasize is that eugenics ideas spread out of Galton's manuscript and they really go everywhere. Here's a whole bunch of different countries where the eugenics ideas spread to. If you want to understand more about how the ideas spread and how the organizations developed and stuff like that, I would recommend this book by Stefan Kuhl, The Rise and Fall of the International Movement for Eugenics and Racial Hygiene. Again, you can, if you're a Brooklyn College student, you can download this from the Brooklyn College Library as a digital book. This is a very interesting book. To give you a sense, again, this is a bit redundant, but here's another book you could go find, the Oxford Handbook, History of Eugenics. And in part one, there, each of these uh, titles here refers to a chapter. They're going to talk about the uh, individual nations and their eugenics history. So we've got one for Britain, South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, China, South Africa, Kenya, Southeast Asia, Germany, France, Netherlands. And it, as you can see, the list is very long. So many countries have their own uh, unique story about how the eugenics movement uh, went and influenced things in society. There's a chapter here for eugenics in the United States, and it was widely embraced in the United States as well. To give you a sense of some of the social policies and ways in which it influenced uh, aspects of society, part two of this handbook explores some of those things. So for example, we have eugenics and racism and scientific racism eugenics and the science of, of genetics, eugenics and fertility control, eugenics and psychiatry and disability, and, um, and several other aspects. So I just wanted to read some of the chapter headings there to give you a sense of the connections. One of the ways in which these ideas spread was through eugenics journals. So these are basically like uh, scientific journals that we would see today where we will see many of them in cognition where people are publishing research on cog cognitive psychology. These journals were publicly available and inside the pages of these journals, people published on uh, eugenics ideology, eugenics methods, and eugenics propaganda. You can go read these things if you'd like. Uh, this one was available from 1909 to 1968 as the Eugenics Review. And I believe all of these ones aren't behind a paywall. And they're sort of here for his, their historical value. There are several eugenics journals. To, um, we're kind of about halfway through the lecture, so let me just explain why was I in Coney Island earlier today? And this brings some of these things a little bit more close to home. So this is a picture of Long Island, and that's Coney Island down here. That's where I was uh, at the Coney Island boardwalk. And over here is the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. This laboratory is still there. But from 1910 to 1939, this was the home of the Eugenics Record Office. And this was the premier uh, central location for the eugenics movement in America. And this office did all sorts of different things. One of the things they did was they kept over a million eugenic fitness cards on American citizens. I'm not sure exactly what they did with those cards, but I think the idea was sort of like a matchmaking system. They wanted to keep track of all of the good Americans and make sure they were paired together somehow to have good American babies and then figure out who the undesirable Americans were and make sure that they didn't have babies. That was the basic idea. Now, what's the connection to Coney Island? 
Um, that's explored in this article, which you can go find. It's called Freaks and Geeks, Coney Island Sideshow Performers and Long Island Eugenicists, 1910 to 1935. And apparently, um, eugenic researchers from the Eugenic Record Office would make day trips from their laboratory down to Coney Island in order to observe the unusual, exotic, and abnormal individuals that were often on display in some of the sideshows down there. And they would use, they would take pictures of these people and use them in eugenics propaganda. As I mentioned previously, there's this idea that if society doesn't embrace eugenics, and figure out ways to stop undesirable people from breeding, then society will eventually collapse because undesirable people like those people from the sideshows at Coney Island will have many children and take over society. This is the, the basic kind of stoking of eugenics fear. So that's the connection to Coney Island. And this transitions into, uh, I just want to show you some examples of eugenics propaganda. These are some ways in which American citizens would have been um, introduced to eugenics ideas through movies, books, posters, state fairs, trained eugenics promoters even, and textbooks. So this is a, a, called the Tree of Eugenics. It's a picture that was put together for one of the international eugenics conferences. I think this one was held in California. And it's a nice picture that shows the hubris of the movement. They think of themselves as the self-direction of human evolution and the natural flowing together of all of these different disciplines, anatomy, biology, physiology, psychology, mental testing, genetics, anthropometry, history, geology, and so on. For them, all of these uh, disciplines of academia and science are flowing together to create a uh, eugenic vision of human progress. So this is sort of a symbol of the movement. They produced all sorts of posters and things. Here's an example where we're seeing um, only healthy seed must be sown Check the seeds of hereditary disease and unfitness by eugenics. If you went to a state fair, you might see a display like this one. These are little light bulbs and they're, they'd be flashing. So this one says this light flashes every 15 seconds. And every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as insane, feeble-minded criminals and other defectives. So this is meant to stoke fear in the public that um, feeble-minded people, which was a word used to describe people with psychological disorders at that time, um, would be, you know, having children and taking over society. Something must be done to stop that. This one is every seven and a half minutes, uh, this light flashes and it suggests that a high grade person is born in the US who will have the ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of all Americans come within this class. And so we have a little announcement for a fitter families contest. You could enroll in a contest to make sure that uh, your family will breed properly you know, to create a high-grade person rather than an insane, defective person. Well, it's, uh, it's a little bit stomach-turning to read this stuff. Here's another one. Um, we have uh, examples of what happens when people marry, and we have mixtures of people of different levels of purity. So if you have two pure people, they can have a normal child. But if you have two abnormal people, you can have an, uh, an abnormal child. Uh, if you have two tainted people, 
you'll get one abnormal, one normal, and two tainted children. So the question is, how long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? Here's an example of a Bitter Families organization. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, if you were to go around to a, a state fair, you might see information about this stuff. So here's some people learning about eugenics at a health exhibit. And this one here is a better babies contest. So we have all these people sitting here with their babies. And this uh, judge is going to go around and measure which babies are the best and would, which would have the highest eugenic qualities of goodness. Uh, several books were published as propaganda for the eugenics movement. Several movies. These two, you can watch them on YouTube. Okay, so let's move into influences on society. And what I want to give you a sense of here are some of the negative consequences uh, that occurred in society along with, and well, this will be the first thing, uh, the basic modus operandi, the way this stuff worked. So what tools did they use? What was their specific goals? And then what were the outcomes in society? So Galton had a pretty methodical vision. And this is from 1883. Check this out. A brief word to express the science of improving stock, which is by no means confined to questions of judicious mating, but which, especially in the case of man, takes cognizance of all influences that tend in however remote a degree to give to the more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than they otherwise would have. I find this quote very fascinating. Um, certainly one part of eugenics was this idea of figuring out ways to breed people. And that could involve things like controlling marriage or controlling who gets to uh, have children with who, or um, controlling aspects of uh, reproduction, any aspect of reproduction. But as we can see in this quote, Galton had a much larger vision, and he was thinking really about any kind of um, way we could give advantages to people he considered uh, better than other people, and to give disadvantages to usually already marginalized people. This was his grand vision. So how was this vision implemented? I've got three basic ideas here about how he did it. So this is a picture from Galton's anthropometric laboratory. And this is a laboratory for measuring things about people, all sorts of things, anything you could imagine. Galton wanted to measure it. So here's a basic program. One, it's testing. You need to measure everything you can about people in order to identify whether they have all the good things that you want or how much of the bad things that they might have or whether they're really just an undesirable person with all bad things. Because eugenics assumed that these features of people are genetically determined, they'd be inherited. Um, they wanted to first identify the good people by the testing, and then um, and, and then implement positive eugenics methods. These are any method that would encourage good people to breed with one another. The opposite of this is negative eugenics. And this is any method uh, to 
stop unfit people from breeding. And if you could achieve that goal, then according to Galton, they would naturally eliminate themselves over generational time. So these were the sort of abstract ideas. Now I want to give you one example of how these ideas were put into practice in, in Britain in the 1920s. So here we have Carl Pearson. This is Francis Galton and Carl Pearson. And you might have heard of him before. Carl Pearson was the statistician who invented the correlation coefficient known as Pearson's R. And he was Galton's protege, and he took over the Galton chair of eugenics at the University of London when Galton died. And he also founded the journal Annals of Eugenics. So this is the paper that he published in the first issue of that journal in 1925. And this is an example of Pearson's applied eugenics research. This paper was part one of four. The entire thing is about 500 pages long. And it is very depressing to read this paper. Uh, let me say at the beginning, this is an example of anti-Semitic research. It is an example of scientific racism and using science to justify uh, preventing Jewish immigration into Great Britain. So the title is The Problem of Alien Immigration into Great Britain, illustrated by an examination of Russian and Polish Jewish children. Uh, this is part one is just the first 50 pages and then it goes on and on for the rest of it. I'd like to give you just a sense of what happens here because it involves the concepts of the anthropometric laboratory. So basically, Carl Pearson uh, identified 500 families. These would be Jewish families, and he measured them. He measured the parents, and he measured the children on as many features as he possibly could. This is the original paper, and in the appendix, you can see the forms that were used uh, for each person to fill out the measurements. So you can get a sense of the kinds of things he was measuring. So this is information about the father's and the mother's nationality, birthplace, whether or not they speak English, details about their family, details about the occupation, income, rent, number of rooms, cleanliness of the house, ventilation, whether the, whether the children wear neckwear, or headgear, blah, blah, and it goes on and on and on. So as you could see, uh, we've got teachers' information about the children, whether they're, um, and information about their abilities in school. And I guess I'll just mention here, we're starting to see and this is general intelligence definitions. We're starting to see some connections into psychology here. So this form has a lots of different measurements, many physical measurements, cultural measurements, uh, genealogical measurements, and psychological measurements, things like general intelligence. Uh, I won't go into the research, which is basically, but I will tell you uh, how he uses the correlation here. So as you can see, people in his study were measured on many features. And I'm just scrolling through. You can see all these tables go by uh, where Pearson is measuring um, w one feature against another. For example, the number of defective teeth as a function of age in years or uh, the percentage of hemoglobin as a function of color of face or uh, percentage of hemoglobin and age. I mean, it, the, the reason why this thing is 500 pages long is because uh, for every pair of things he measured, he is, tries to establish potential correlations between these things. The result is very disturbing. 
the conclusions that he makes are um, to say that Jewish families are inferior in terms of eugenic measurements and eugenic qualities, and he uses this as a basis to argue that they should, that Jewish immigrants should not be allowed into Great Britain. Uh, additionally, this is a blueprint, I, in my opinion, on how to, uh, that, the, that the Germans probably would have used in order to, um, or scratch that, uh, my, uh, what I was going to say was, you know, this is 1925, this is a, published in a British journal and we have a systematic method for identifying aspects of Jewish people. And I would, you know, it, se it seemed likely to me that the Nazi regime would have been aware of this type of research and maybe use it as a blueprint as a part of um, their uh, Holocaust of the Jewish people in World War II. So this uh, gets into some of the consequences we were talking about, or I was referring to earlier. In the previous slide, we saw an example of a eugenics testing program on people being used to advocate for uh, particular social policies. And there's many more examples of these uh, one of them I already referred to was the Nazi atrocities. In the United States, we have involuntary institutionalization and forced sterilization. So people who were measured or maybe not measured on these types of forms uh, could be institutionalized, taken away from their families and put into hospitals, institutions out in the middle of nowhere so that they couldn't breed with other people. Another way to stop undesirable, quote, people from breeding is to forcibly sterilize them. And that practice was legalized in many states. We also see anti-miscegenation or selective intermarriage laws. So um, part of the eugenics movement was to uh, prevent or encourage intermarriage depending on which country you're talking about. There are several racial segregation policies that are motivated by eugenics ideology. In education, we see lots of the testing regimes, so standardized testing, intelligence testing, gifted education programs, and things like residential schools. In the context of industry in the military, we see mental testing being used to answer all sorts of questions. Next lecture, we'll learn about an example where the United States military employed uh, intelligence testing in order to answer questions like who should be sent to the front to die and who should be an officer. One of the points I've been trying to make in this uh, little lecture is to point out that eugenics was a widespread social movement and for a long time there was many uh, people who supported the movement in positions of power and in America this included presidents, elected officials, uh, people who headed up government funding agencies, university presidents, society presidents, faculty members, and prominent members of society at large. So it's not just a weird idea that Francis Galton had in 1865. And it permeated society in many ways. We are still grappling with the impact it has had. Okay, this is a good time to transition briefly into psychology and eugenics. We're not going to talk about it a lot in this lecture. If you want to learn more about those connections, check out this paper by uh, Yakushko from 2019. It's shorter than her book and review some of the historical connections. One of the things that interested me when I read this paper was I saw this, this is from her article, 
that between 1892 and 1947, which is a fairly, you know, it's a like half century, 31 presidents of the American Psychological Association were publicly listed as leaders of various eugenic organizations. Now, if we look at the American Psychology Association presidents, and here's a list of them here from APA, they list them all. Uh, we could go right down to 1892. You can see there's a new president every year. So for a long time, from 1892 till, oh, we're getting there, 1947, a lot of these people were involved in the eugenics movement. And what does that mean? We'll explore that when we talk more about intelligence testing. Even today, uh, many psychologists who were also prominent me members of eugenics societies uh, are venerated by societies. Like, for example, the APA gives the E.L. Thorndike Career Achievement Award in Education, so, uh, Educational Psychology. There's the Granville Stanley Hall Award in Development Psychology and Robert Yerkes Award in Military Psychology. The APS gives the James McKean Cattell Award for contributions to applied research. And the Society for Experimental Psychology gives the Howard Crosby Warren Medal for Outstanding Achievement in Experimental Psychology. And all of these people have were, were deeply involved in the eugenics movement in the United States. When, as I've learned about the connections between psych, early psychologists in America and eugenics, I've discovered that uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know. And uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like many psychology societies have been uh, attempting to address these connections for a very long period of time. Very recently, and we're talking October 2021, so like a couple of months ago, for the very first time, the American Psychological Association has issued an, apolo an apology. So we could go there. They're, they have an apology to people of color for APA's role in promoting, perpetuating, and failing to challenge racism, racial discrimination, and human hierarchy in the United States. And there's many ways, many, many ways in which they failed to do that. So it's pretty interesting that uh, they've uh, that they have made this public apology. If you're interested in another way to figure out some of the connections, the APA has done a pretty good job of creating a historical chronology, and this covers some of the things I talk about in the textbook chapter. If you scroll down here. We've got a little timeline beginning with uh, Francis Galton in 1869. And this chronology focuses on connections between eugenics and psychology, which are numerous. And we'll start making those connections in the next lecture. To prep you for the basic way the connections work, we have these eugenics journals. And in the eugenics journals, researcher or people in the movement they talk about their ideology, they talk about uh, tools that would be necessary to enforce different policies. We have psychology journals. Um, and if we look at the research that is contemporaneous with eugenics, we see many cases where psychologists are actively developing tools for uh, the purposes of the eugenics movement. And when these tools are applied in society, we see them influencing all sorts of different systems, like educational systems, healthcare systems, and impacting laws. So this is how I see psychology fitting in in the grander scheme. The main tool we'll be talking about are mental testing. And here's an example from 1890. We have James McKean Cattell writing on mental tests and measurements. And he would eventually be a chair at, or he would be at Columbia University. At this point, I think he's at uh, University of Pennsylvania. He'd made a trip across 
the Atlantic Ocean to go visit one Mr. Francis Galton and basically was bringing Galton's ideas back to the U.S. And we will talk more about this in the next mini lecture on intelligence testing. Okay, so in order to prepare for that one, read chapter four on intelligence testing from the textbook. When you're finished with that, uh, complete any quizzes or assignments of your choice. And I'm signing off for now. We'll see you in the next lecture.